So there are plenty of how to set up your microphone videos out there. But as some of you may know, on this channel, I really emphasize going deeper. Sure, we can understand how to set up our gear in order to record audio, but it is much better for you if you understand what's happening below that surface level. I mean, come on, I have faith in you that you can actually plug in a cable from a mic to an audio interface. But do you understand what that microphone is doing? And do you understand what is inside of that audio interface that's actually producing a signal? Because all of these things are going to make you a better audio engineer. And hey, if you're just a creator, it's gonna make your audio way better, more professional, and could take you that bit higher to the next level. So we're going to demystify the technology behind what you're working with, as well as get you to a point where you can set up your audio. So contrary to you know what you might think, there's actually some skill involved in microphone placement in terms of voiceover and communication. And there's also some skill involved in setting the right the proportions on your preamps and all the things like that. So beyond my initial subscriber base, I'm going to assume if you're watching this video, you probably came from a USB microphone and you have your first XLR microphone. And that's really a good thing. And that's because if you want to take an audio signal, which is really just air pressure, right? And change it into something that your computer can actually hear, it needs to be changed from what's called an analog signal into a digital signal. And before, on your USB microphone, that all happened within the microphone itself. Now that you've changed to an XLR microphone, we're taking all of that process out of the microphone and we're putting it in this thing, an audio interface, which is something I'm sure you bought as well if you have an XLR microphone. This is gonna result in a few things, but the most important thing is noise. USB microphones are known to have a hiss if you process them too much, or just in general. You'll notice your microphone is a lot more quiet, cleaner, and in general, it's going to have better audio fidelity. Not to mention, when it comes to having an audio interface and an XLR setup, you're going to have much more customizability. You can keep the same microphone and update the microphone interface that you're putting it into, or you can keep this interface and have seven or eight microphones. Remember, these things come with multiple inputs oftentimes. You can start to build an actual studio. You're developing a system here. You're developing an audio studio whether you meant to or not. But in order to understand your new system, we're actually not going to talk about the microphone. We're gonna talk about this, the audio interface. This is a really crucial part of your tone, your sound, and in your audio quality. So this is what's responsible for that analog to digital conversion I was talking about before. Please, please focus. Ah, it's fine. This one will focus, right? This is, that wasn't really necessary, was it? <laughs> See, this takes an analog signal, turns it into a digital signal that your computer can understand, and then pumps it back out as another analog signal that your speakers or your headphones can then understand, otherwise known as an analog to digital, digital to analog converter, A to D, or D to A. On these audio interfaces, you will see a number of different knobs. All, most of these are what we call preamps, or the things that actually control the power or the gain level of your microphone. On top of this, you'll see a headphone volume monitor to, for testing the volume of live monitoring, which is what I'm doing now. Or maybe things like a mixer, which might control the level of what you hear in your DAW versus what you hear on the incoming signal. Now, it's important to note that microphone level is extremely small, and these preamps are responsible for taking something that is really virtually like a thousandth of a volt in electronic power and turning it into something that is much louder. Now, we do this through the preamps or those knobs. The, the longer we turn the knob or the further we turn the knob, the more powerful the signal. Now, when you think about it, we're taking a signal that is extremely small, like I said, a thousandth of a volt, and we're taking it to something that we can audibly hear. The system involved with amplifying that audio is obviously going to affect your sound a lot, which is why your preamps are, are going to inform your audio a lot more than you might think at first. Now, preamps are a whole nother topic and there's a wide variety of them, but you should know that there are typically kind of two ways to think of a preamp, which is a, a colored preamp and a transparent preamp. We're gonna start with the transparent preamp. Most of the time, when you're dealing with an audio interface, these preamps are designed to be transparent. Now, when we say transparent, the goal is to not add a lot of harmonic content. A, a, a transparent preamp, a, a transparent, a transparent preamp is really going to do its best to not influence the sound of your microphone. It's trying to make the microphone sound as transparent, as clear, 
and as honest as possible without adding any underlying characteristics to it. Now, in contrast to this, a lot of older, more vintage preamps are going to add coloration, particularly in the low or mid-range. These older technologies utilize things like transformers or even tubes, which are literally pieces of glass that warm up to extreme levels, and, and they actually influence how the microphone gets processed further down the line. You might consider them to be warmer or smoother or have a more vintage, darker tone to them. But perhaps you didn't need that much info. You were just here to set up your microphone and I'm going way too deep. But that is the point of this video. Now, what you do actually need beyond all that extra info I just gave you is you do need an audio interface that can match the level of gain requirements for your specific microphone. And there's one microphone that you might have bought for Christmas that is going to be an offender of this. And it's right here. This one. I'll just take it off. Let's take the SM7B for example. It's characteristically gain hungry. What that means is to bring this to the level that I'm speaking at right now, which is around negative 12 dB peaking, you'll see it on your audio software. I know this is a lot to take in. In order to get it to that level, it requires a lot of gain, anywhere from 55 dBs to 60 dBs depending on who you ask. Now, not all audio interfaces are going to be providing this. For example, the one I've been using to like give you as an example the whole time is the AudioBox USB. It's a pretty old interface by this time, but it only has 45 dBs of gain, which means when it comes to something like the Shure SM7B, it won't be able to power it very well. Now, if I'm a guessing person, you probably have a Scarlet since that seems to be the most popular choice. This is going to be okay. It's going to provide around 55 dBs of gain, which should be fine for most microphones and if not, you can always process it later. So to reiterate, you're going to need to turn the preamp or that knob on your interface until you see your microphone start to peak in between negative 24 and negative 12 dB. That's a pretty wide range. Some people might say negative 18 to negative 12, but do some research if you haven't already to find the audio interface that matches your gain levels that you need for your microphone. Right, so the next thing in that chain, we're gonna be working backwards towards the microphone itself would be the XLR cable. The thing that gives the microphone its name, and in order to describe the XLR cable, I've got a whiteboard, and we're going to do some diagramming, so let's go over there. Hello, and uh, welcome to the whiteboard. Let's discuss how an XLR works. So, if you see the front of your XLR, you will see three little prongs, right? One of these is called the ground. The ground, the ground is basically just meant so you don't kill yourself. It carries an electrical load and carries it to a safe spot so that you don't electrocute yourself in uh, the unfortunate circumstance that that might happen. Well, let's just take this ground wire and we're going to put it just like that. If you look, this is one end of the cable with all three inputs. This is the other end of the cable. I hope this makes sense. The red line is your actual audio signal. This is the actual thing that will be recorded later. So let's just say we record a sine wave, which if we re remember from science class, sine waves, a sine wave is, is the one every science teacher draws, right? So looks like this. This is sine wave. Here's what that sine wave sounds like. So this is our signal, our sine wave. This is the ground that's keeping us from dying. What's this little blue one? Well, this is what we call a polarized signal. It is the exact same signal as the red signal that we're sending, but it's flipped. So, it looks like this. It is a perfect mirror image of your actual signal. That's what we call polarized. Now, if we remember from math class, one signal plus the negative of that signal which is negative one, what does that equal? Well, it equals zero. So what we've effectively done is canceled out the signal while it's inside of the cable, therefore stopping any noise from being introduced while carrying through the process. The process of polarization happens here, and then it is flipped back to normal phase here. And that's how an XLR cable works. What we're essentially doing is cutting out any of the signal and therefore any of the background noise that you might get from your XLR cable while it's going through that actual cable way, roadway, road, roadway cable. 
cable roadway. So we're finally at the microphone, which is probably where you wanted to be the entire time during this entire video, but it's important to talk about all the other things that you have in your new audio system since you just came from that USB microphone. I'm going to assume that you already know the difference between a dynamic microphone and a condenser microphone, but if you don't, that's totally cool. I have a whole separate video dedicated to that topic and I'll link it right here. We're going to talk about microphone positioning. It's important to note that if you're working with a dynamic microphone, the position is going to be pretty different than it would be if you were working with a condenser microphone. Both microphones, as you get further away, will pick up more of the room and the more room reflections rather than the actual audio source. But it's important to note that a dynamic microphone, such as what I'm speaking into right now, will roll off much quicker. And this is because the way that the dynamic microphone picks up sound, specifically a magnet with a copper wire wrapped around it, that's a lot less sensitive than the way that a condenser microphone picks up sound which is via a diagram which has much more surface area in order to actually sort of flex and bend under the the pressure of sound but the good news is we have a general position that works for both but the microphone position itself might change in distance now we want to make sure that we're stopping ourselves from producing plosives producing plosives those are the p sounds that you have in your speech and you'll notice my microphone is actually angled to the to the left of me at your left uh, and you'll notice it's also angled at around a, like a 45 degree angle. And that's because my, my, my sound waves, my, my air noise, yeah, my, my words, <laughs> uh, my words are going directly past the microphone rather than actually hitting it itself. It's picking up the audio source from an angle. That way I don't get plosives. Now this has a pretty good microphone for for, um, for for rejecting plosives as it is, and I'll provide an example of a really nasty plosive right now. Here's a mic with pretty much no plosive protection. Poop. <laughs> so um, we want to keep our microphone at an angle uh, to the side of us, pointing at the audio source, and we're going to be speaking past it. In general, it's safe to keep the microphone around four to seven inches for a dynamic microphone away from your source. Same for a condenser microphone, although I would probably recommend like seven to eight inches, maybe nine inches, and that's because a condenser microphone is much more sensitive to dynamic range. What that means is I can get really loud with the like, with the. I live in an apartment and that made me uncomfortable. I, I can get really loud with a dynamic microphone and uh, it's probably not gonna clip nearly as easily as if that was a condenser microphone. That's because they're much more sensitive to dynamic change. And you know what, in terms of the microphone, that's probably all you need to know. Most of the work is going to happen in the audio interface itself, setting the gain on your preamp so you're hitting around negative 12 to negative 18 dB, Boost it later to like negative six if you want to. You probably should. And then it's just a matter of figuring out the program you're using. If you're using something like Reaper or a DAW, a digital audio workstation, you're gonna to wanna to go into the input devices and you're gonna to wanna to select your audio interface. It should show up there as long as you have the drivers installed if you're on Windows. Mac, you don't have to worry about it. From there, it gets a little bit program specific. So if you're working on something like Premiere or if you're working on something that is in general meant for recording video, just go into your audio tab and find the input device and record from there. All right, guys, I hope this was helpful. Uh, I hope this was a needless amount of info, but at the same time left you with enough that you are more well-versed in your audio tech than you would be if I just told you how to plug in a mic to an interface. So with that, you can follow me on Instagram at Real Audio Haze. If you'd like to work on a project with me, you could email me at realaudiohaze at gmail.com. And here's the outro song. Goodbye.